You're listening to Keeping It Real with Janine podcast, your guide to living an authentic, healthy life. Today's inspiring conversation is with Dr. Mary Ruert, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot today. Dr. Ruert is a research scientist, ethicist, and a libertarian author and activist. She received her BS in biochemistry in 1970 and her PhD in biophysics in 74. As a research scientist at Upjohn, Dr. Ruert was involved in developing new therapies for a variety of diseases such as liver cirrhosis and AIDS. She left Upjohn in 1995 to consult and write. Dr. Ruert teaches communications courses for scientists and provides consulting services for nutraceutical companies, clinical research organizations, and universities. Her radical application of ethics to medical regulation, especially regulations regarding pharmaceuticals, truly has life and death implications. Dr. Ruertz already has an international best-selling book, Healing Our World, demonstrating how the ethical application of libertarian principles has historically created harmony and abundance, and that many of our current policies surreptitiously violate the basic ethical standards that we hold dear. Her new book, Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It, just recently became available. Thank you for being here, Dr. Ruert. Well, thanks for having me. It's, it's a delight. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. We obviously have a lot to talk about, but I would like to start with your journey, your story of how you, how you came to be interested in medical ethics and libertarian principles. And then we can get into that 1962 amendment to the Food and Drug Act in your new book. Well, I read Ayn Rand in college, mm. and I was struck that, you know, the libertarian principle seemed like something that would be uh, very ethical, obviously, uh, very moral, but also uh, very practical. Mm -hmm. In fact, the way I look at it, the, the practical and the ethical or moral, if you prefer that term, really are two sides of the same coins. I mean, if if we had an ethic or a moral and it didn't work in the real world, you know, we'd probably throw it out pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. it has to be, has to be both. And, and that's what struck me about the libertarian ethic. And that's what, what I focused on in healing our world. I think it's still the, probably the best uh, or most comprehensive, I should say, compilation of how liberty works in the real world. So that's that's how I got started on that. And of course, in high school, I was very interested in research. So that was a natural flow to go into the uh, research area and uh, continue on uh, with the Upjohn Company, which I joined in the mid-1970s. And I, I learned quite a bit about a lot of things that you're very interested in. <laughs> One of the first things, you know, you have to do when you're doing research in disease is you have to have an animal model. And back in the 70s, we didn't have the genetic manipulation that we have today. Mm -hmm. So we had these very healthy rats that, you know, had had their their diet titrated so well that they just didn't get sick. So in order to get disease models, what we had to do is either take away their vitamins or give them a diet that was overwhelming in fat or overwhelming in sugar. And so, of course, very early on, all of us researchers learned that optimal nutrition is really the key to optimal health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you can't sell optimal nutrition in, in a pill. <laughs> well, actually, in some ways, you know, you, you probably could have. I mean, in the, in, you know, before these amendments in 1962 were put in place, the drug companies were actually very interested in nutrition. And one of the reasons they were is they were really the only companies that could make large quantities of vitamins. They probably put the first vitamins on the market, uh, one a day, multiple vitamins. Um, Upjohn had um, their, uh, their version of the, uh, the, the one a day, multiple vitamins. And so we were very aware of nutrition in the research departments. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and they probably, the companies probably would have continued working in nutrition uh, if the 1962 amendments weren't present. But what those amendments did, one of the many things they did, is they increased the time that it took for a drug to get from the lab bench to the marketplace from four to about 14 years. 
Oh, so, wow. What was, yeah, the ration, what was the rationale for that? Well, the 1962 amendments told the FDA that in addition to the safety testing that they already demanded, they had to demand effectiveness testing for drugs. And the way the FDA interpreted the amendments was that they had to have very, very high standards, which in the time I was working were two U.S. studies with statistical significance of 0.05, which is a very high barrier. And that's, you know, I know a lot of your listeners probably don't know what that means, but it means we had to really have a lot of patients in the study. We had to, uh, you know, make sure we were looking at the right parameters. And if we didn't get it right the first time, we had to repeat it and make a bigger study. So since these studies take years, you can imagine, especially if you have a really new product, and you guess wrong on any of the things that you need to know, like what the dose needs to be, mm-hmm. how often you have to give it, how many years you have to treat, and how many patients you need. If you guess wrong, you have to start over. And that's why it starts getting to be very long and involved. And, and th- these extra studies really didn't do much for increasing the effectiveness of drugs because the marketplace was already pretty much weeding out all the drugs that didn't work because nobody would buy them. The doctors saw they didn't work and they just didn't prescribe them. Mm -hmm. So it didn't help. But because of this long development time, anything that didn't have a patent really couldn't be worked on anymore because if you take 14 years to put a drug on the market, obviously your costs are so much greater. You have to have a patent in order to recover your development costs. And when I joined the Upjohn company, we still were developing drugs or nutritionals that didn't have to have a patent. But while I was there, just a couple of years later, the word came down from upper management that only patented products would be developed. So that's part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Ah, now, now that's becoming clear. So where did 14 years come from? I mean, that sounds like that just got pulled out of somebody's head somewhere. <laughs> well, what happens is the FDA demands certain studies, but along the way, if it sees anything it wants done differently, it basically instructs the drug company to do things differently. And you can imagine that over a 14 year period, just from the political standpoint, things change. So we actually had to go back sometimes and repeat studies that we had already done and do them a little differently. And sometimes we had to anticipate what was going to happen. So that really, you know, really created a big barrier to entry as well. So if you have a small company and you want to get an FDA approved drug, it's very difficult to do it because you have to raise basically what today is about two and a half billion dollars per drug. Wow. Yeah. So that's really, it's really a tough barrier to beat. Does this have to do with why, um, like for nutraceuticals, you, you can't, you can't say what that's it <laughs> what they do yes you see what happens is the fda does not believe commercial speech is protected by the first amendment of our constitution so if mm. you want to say for example let me give you a real life example that will help sure so in the early 1980s we knew that the b vitamin folic acid would prevent neural tube defects it's a type of birth defect that's a very bad one most children are institutionalized when they have that. Mm -hmm. We knew that folic acid taken in the first month or two of pregnancy, when most women don't even know they're pregnant, uh, could actually basically wipe these birth defects out. Mm -hmm. But the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers that it would shut them down if they even pointed to these published studies in the scientific literature. And this was horrific because it wasn't until about 12 years later that the Center for Disease Control started making the recommendation that young women take folic acid to make sure that if they got pregnant, their babies would be okay. And and even when this other government agency was making this recommendation, the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers they couldn't even mention it because it's considered a health claim. And if you want to make a health claim, you have to go through these 14 years of regulatory box checking. (laughs) So... So, you know, in the meantime, of course, we had probably about 10,000 children needlessly born with these birth defects. 
And many others were aborted because you can test for this, you know, while the woman's carrying the child. Mm -hmm. So this is really horrible. And what's so ironic about it is that these amendments were passed to prevent birth defects in children uh, from a drug thalidomide, which was approved mm -hmm. in, but not in the U.S. So it's it's really it really backfired. And this is why it is so difficult to. I think in terms of prevention, especially when you're working with your regular physician, because, you know, the, the, the people who are developing preventative medicine in the supplement industry uh, cannot legally go to a doctor's office and tell them, hey, you know, our, our vitamin or our fish oil or whatever it is really works well for this, that, and the other thing. Because if they haven't done all that testing, <laughs> it's against the law. Mm -hmm. And this I is how... Uh, we've shifted our paradigm from inexpensive prevention to expensive treatment because of these amendments. Um, oh, wow. So this is where it, it starts. I had no idea. I, I'm trying to understand where the logic is in this. Is this like really, is it a political thing? Is it a what? I, well, I, it's, it's always a mix, but but basically this this idea that that an advertiser cannot advertise a health claim without having it being blessed by the FDA is, of course, what the amendments did. So now there has been some movement to say that we should exclude foods and vitamins uh, and other nutrients from this requirement. But it's, you know, the FDA, of course, uses our tax dollars to go to court and has gotten the courts to agree that if a, a manufacturer or a grower of food or a manufacturer of vitamins makes a health claim, it turns the food or the vitamin into a drug, and therefore it is subject to all the FDA regulations. Oh, okay. That makes sense. I mean, I, I can see where there is a, you know, there is a need for this on some level, but it just, it seems like it's, oh, what do I want to say? It's like, it's too much. It's too, too it's broad. Overkill. It's too broad. Yeah. Overkill. It's, it's quite literally overkill because according to my calculations, and these calculations are just based on what it did to the pharmaceutical industry, not the prevention industry, which I think is even bigger. Just what it did to the pharmaceutical industry probably shaved five to 10 years off our lives. And if you, if you think that the prevention or lack thereof because of these amendments was even more horrific, and I do believe that, then you can imagine there's another five to 10 years at least that we've had shaved off our life. And that's why I say how we were robbed of a golden age of health and how we can reclaim it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's not even taking in effect quality of life. I mean, if you're talking about shaving off five to 10 years, I, I assume, and I may be wrong, but I assume you're saying, you know, uh, death. Um, death, but yes, but then right. there's also quality, which to me that's is correct. even more important because if your quality of life sucks because you're in pain all the time or you don't have any energy or you feel like crap, to me it's like what's the point? The you know nothing else really matters. Doesn't make any difference whether you're wealthy or don't have anything or you've got everything. If your if your health isn't there, it's not a quality existence. Yes. So if I may ask, how did you um, come up with this? I'm really curious because I, <laughs> I love research myself. But how did you, what, what did you do to come up with this uh, shaving off five to 10 years of, uh, of, of life? Well, first of all, um, you know, obviously when it takes 14 years instead of four years to get a life-saving drug to market, there is a, there's a problem there. People die waiting. And so there have been estimates made of how many lives the drugs that are currently on the market save, and they had delays. So I took it decade by decade and calculated from that how many Americans have lost their lives from these amendments. And I should mention that these, the impact of these amendments kind of ripple outward into the world since the U.S. produces most or does the most discovery in new drugs. So mm -hmm. it, this doesn't just apply to the U.S., but in the U.S., 15 million Americans have died waiting for life-saving drugs, which is about 10 times more than we've the lives that we've lost in all the wars since our country's inception. Mm 
Wow. And the, the other thing is the loss of innovation. That's even bigger. Um, if you think about it, if a new drug can't make it to market because there's not enough people that will benefit from it or because it's just too costly, mm -hmm. you know, then we lose innovation. And studies show that we lose about 50% of our new drugs in late stage development. And then we lose even more, I think, uh, before the development even gets started. For example, let me let me share a little story with your listeners sure. on how this works. So the FDA found out that I had applied for a patent for prostaglandins and liver disease. And as you probably know, prostaglandins are a natural hormone that you, every cell in your body makes. And they're called eicosanoids today. If you take fish oil, you're taking it so that your body will make what we call the good prostaglandins or the mm. good eicosanoids. Okay. So <clears throat> the FDA found out I was had filed this patent. They called me up and said, we really want to help you get this drug to market because there's nothing for this type of liver disease. 100,000 people die every year. And I was all excited because I was young and naive, and I thought that would make a difference. <laughs> but the problem is, again, when you are when you have something really new, you don't know what dose to give. You don't know how often you have to give it. You don't know how many years you have to give it for. And you don't know how many patients you need to enroll in the study in order to get the FDA's required statistical significance. Mm -hmm. And if you guess wrong, again, you have to repeat these very long studies. And the company decided it just wasn't worth the risk because if we had to repeat studies, our drug would be off patent by the time we got to market. Mm -hmm. So that never even got started in development, really. And so the the... We probably lost 50 to 80 percent of our innovations, but I estimated if we lost 50 percent of our innovations and they were only 25 percent as effective as the ones we have on the market today, that's another 26.7 million people. And then I was able to estimate, uh, for example, the delays in getting the information about how aspirin helped heart disease patients out. That was a similar story to the folic acid story. And so... You know, if you add all that up, then about half of the people who have died since 1962 of disease have lost uh, 10 to 11 years of their lives. So one way to look at it is half of us are going to lose 10 to 11 years of our lives, or all of us are going to lose five to 10 years, uh, five, five years, five and a half years of our lives. So <laughs> mm -hmm. you can kind of see. And now this is only the drug industry. We haven't even talked about prevention yet. And I think that is an even bigger number, but it's very difficult to estimate. Mm -hmm. And I think the prevention aspect is even more important because yes. you don't need, hopefully, all of these pharmaceuticals if you're focused on prevention as opposed to waiting until you're sick, which a lot of people do. They don't do anything. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I have heart disease or I have diabetes, like it just came on, you know? I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, and, and the other aspect of prevention is that even though, of course, prevention is the best thing, we, we still don't have enough knowledge about it. So sometimes we do need drugs. But the problem is the drugs we have on the market today uh, are usually what I call lifestyle drugs. In other words, they they are intended to be taken for years or even decades. And the problem with that from, from a, a health standpoint is that our body has trouble handling something for that long because it depletes our nutrients in order to detoxify them. And yet that the amendments have caused that problem because unless you're making a drug that people are going to take for decades, it's very, very hard to recover your development costs. They increase every year and they increase exponentially. The only reason we don't have a longer timeline than 14 years for development is that companies have gotten better and better at compressing that time. Timeline. Unfortunately, the FDA is always requiring more and more studies every year, so the expense goes up every year. And if you plot the uh, what we pay at the pharmacy for brand name drugs, which are the new drugs, mm -hmm. versus uh, you know the regulatory costs, there's a direct correlation. So drug prices are going up not because companies are greedy, although all companies are to some extent, <laughs> mm -hmm. but but they're going up because the cost of putting the drug on the market is going up. And if they don't raise the prices, 
uh, you know, they won't stay in business and there won't be any new drugs. So that's, you know, the, the amendments have caused one problem after another. And when we look at these problems and we say, oh, big pharma is really um, giving us all these high priced products and they, you know, they're interacting and they're having safety issues. And this is why it's because of the amendments. And unless we realize what the problem is, we won't be able to fix it. And that's why I wrote this book, because if we really want to fix it, we need to know what's causing the problems. And it's just about invisible to anyone who's not in the industry. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I consider myself to be pretty uh, knowledgeable in this area. And I've done a lot of research and I had no idea. Yes. Well, that's why I'm writing, you know, I put this book together because nobody knows it's all hidden. And the insiders don't dare talk about it because if you if you think about it for a moment, if somebody in the drug industry said, hey, these regulations are hurting consumers, not helping them, it would sound as if they're um, <clears throat> as if they're simply being selfish and don't want to be regulated. But it's not that at all. It's that these regulations are just bad law and bad law can be just as deadly as bad drugs. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, it, it's interesting that going back to something you just said a couple minutes ago about uh, the the longevity or the, the need to take drugs for such a long period of time. And and that 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 sounds like that's kind of built in. Well, it is now with the amendments. Yeah, there's there's no way a company can stay solvent if they don't if they aren't producing a drug that's either super expensive uh, and some of our cancer drugs are super expensive because of that, or if they are meant to be taken for a lifetime. Wow. Well, of course, part of the reason that there's the problems is that the doctors will prescribe medicine, but what they're not very good at is prescribing prevention or even reversing some of the bad habits that people have uh, in order to reverse their condition. For example, type 2 diabetes can be reversed to a very large extent, if not completely, by changing diet and exercise. And yet physicians really aren't trained in that. And in fact, if anything, they are trained to think of those things as supplemental, but not really important. And And that's unfortunate because, you know, that's something that we really need to bring back. But since people who advocate lifestyle changes, supplements and exercise can't legally go into doctor's offices and talk to them about their product, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very difficult for the doctors to learn about it. But of course the drug reps can go in and educate the doctors to some degree at least mm -hmm. about you know what they what their drugs do. They can't talk about off label use very easily. What off label use is is the use of approved drugs that are used in a way that's different from what they were approved for. Mm -hmm. And that's another issue is that sometimes drugs that are on the market for one thing actually turn out to be really great for something else. Mm -hmm. Right. But but there's, again, the amendments uh, have, have given the FDA the power to say, no, you can't talk about those things. Well, you know, I find it very interesting because from my personal experience, when I've gone to different medical doctors who are, say, general practitioners, you know, I know they're busy. And if they don't really have a, a strong interest in an area, for example, just personally, thyroid issues for me, thyroid adrenal <laughs> issues. It's like I have to educate them because it's it's a very complex topic. And if they don't have an interest in it, all they want to do, <clears throat> excuse me, all they want to do is look at the lab work and adjust your medication. And, mm -hmm. and that's it. And I've brought up other topics and they just, they just don't seem interested you know, that are, are, are have to do with thyroid issues and, and adrenal issues. And, you know, I, I remember talking to the, this, this was the last uh, uh, appointment I had with this one doctor, but I had been taking my temperature regularly to, to check on my thyroid. And it was always low, never normal. And I mean, like, you know, 96 point something, 95 point something, really low. I said, you know, look, I, I know my lab work is quote unquote normal, but I'm still feeling really tired, brain fog. I don't feel good. And, and my body temperature is really low. And his response was, oh, a lot of people have low body temperature. 
<laughs> yes. And that was when I decided I need another doctor. This is obviously not going to work. <laughs> yes, I, I empathize with you because, again, that's an aspect of prevention that we need to know about but our doctors aren't trained in it. And part of the reason is that I think for a long time, the thyroid treatments were natural products like Armour Thyroid. <laughs> well, that's what I'm back on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so today they try to put you on, on products that are regular drugs rather than a, a natural product. And, and those have some difficulties compared to armor, for example. So it's it's really unfortunate that we've let this come about. And part of the reason, uh, although this isn't covered in my book, are the licensing laws for physicians. You know, all the physicians have to be licensed by their state boards. And mm -hmm. the problem is some of these boards are, they kind of act like a mini FDA in a lot of ways. And they demand that the doctors follow a standard of care instead of really being responsive to individual patients and experimenting a little with different things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, doctors used to do that a lot. Today, they're pretty much slapped down if they go out of the standard of care. I know when I've gone to some specialists and have suggested things or tried to talk to them about things, they go, oh, no, that's not standard of care. We can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah, actually, I have a good example of that. Because when I was a visiting nurse, I was also um, teaching touch for health. And I, I used to use my touch for health skills with my patients and their spouses, mainly for pain, things like that. And I got called in one day by my supervisor. And she said, What are you doing? And I said, I'm, you know, I'm helping someone feel better. And she said, You can't do that. And I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. And she said, because it's not part of our standard of care. And I said, you mean to tell me if I'm sitting next to someone who's in pain and I can easily, by d muscle testing, just rubbing a few points, help them that I can't do that? She said, yes. And I had to leave. I couldn't. I said, well, I can't do this then. Yeah, I understand totally. Yes. And and so this is the kind of way our health care has been hijacked. And if you're in the healthcare industry, you may have some idea about it, like like you do. But if you're not in the healthcare industry, it's very difficult, even for a journalist who wanted to figure all this out, to really go and interview people and find all of this information. And that's again why I wrote Death by Regulation because I wanted to be sure that information was out there. Not a whole lot of people are able to put it in the proper context, and I felt I was. I was able to, so I wanted to get that out there for people so they understood what the problem was because a lot of the things that people are recommending to reform the drug industry and lower drug prices are just going to make things worse. Mm -hmm. For example, if you, if you legislate drug prices, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to drop innovation even more because obviously if the drug company can't recover its development costs, it's going to go out of business. So that's not good. Uh, but of course, even worse, in my opinion, is the impact these amendments have on prevention. Mm -hmm. And because the FDA has gone to court on this a number of occasions and gotten rulings that are favorable to it, in one sense, the amendments now have been codified in our court cases, in our case law. And so really to do away with the amendments, we have to do more than just getting rid of them. We probably at this point can only really get rid of them by taking the approval power away from the FDA. And that's scary to some people, but uh, you know, the, th the thing that we can do is leave the FDA in place as a certifying agency. So it can give its opinion. And any person who wants to wait uh, for these 14 years and wait for the FDA to bless the studies and bless the drug, they, they can do that. But if they're like the AIDS patients who mm. couldn't afford to wait, then they can do something else. When we were working on AIDS, the the patients couldn't wait that long. So what they did is they went to black market chemists and had them make the very drugs we were working on. And by the time the FDA gave us permission to put them in people, every AIDS patient in the country had had them. 
and was resistant. And we had to wait for new diagnoses in order to do the studies that the FDA required. And of course, the award-winning movie, Dallas Buyers Club, shows how the FDA prosecuted and persecuted the buyers clubs that were distributing these drugs. Mm -hmm. And they, they were selective. They went after the people in Texas because they were pretty much loners. But the ones in California, they didn't dare touch because there would have been a big media storm about how the FDA is really harming patients by having the process take so long to get a new drug to market. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds a little bit like what's going on, although I I think it's more of a a political thing uh, now with CBD oil. Oh, yes, yes. And of course, that's a whole nother story. That's not necessarily related to the amendments. But when they had the Marijuana Tax Act um, put out, that really, of course, limited uh, what people could do with marijuana. And it used to be in the what we call the pharmacopoeia, which is like a big encyclopedia of all the drugs. Mm-hmm. And it showed all the different uses. So it, it's it's been medicinally used uh, for generations. And we really lost something that was uh, natural and helpful when that happened. Mm-hmm. I know. And it isn't, it, it isn't even psychoactive. I, mean, it's like, I know. It's what crazy. is the problem here? Just... <laughs> well, it's political, of course. I mean, you know, in a sense, there's been a whole, um, whole establishment uh, that's grown up around the war on drugs. Uh, you know, about 50% of our federal prisoners are are in there because they had uh, possession of cannabis. And so there's a big prison industry around it. About half of our law enforcement effort goes into tracking down drug users and usually the peaceful ones because the you know police don't want to get shot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, and and so they go after the marijuana users, and the courts, of course, are all clogged up because they have so many war on drug cases. And prohibition didn't work with alcohol, and it's certainly not working with drugs either. So we're not even gaining anything. Countries that have legalized uh, cannabis and even hard drugs are doing a much better job of keeping the addiction rate low and keeping the drugs out of their schools because. Uh, as the, as one uh, gentleman said, <laughs> they've managed to make taking drugs boring. <laughs> mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Well, that's right. We're jailing people for trying to feel good. I mean, how how crazy is that? If if people are taking drugs and we're trying to prevent them from harming themselves, how much more harm are we doing by throwing them in jail and destroying their lives? It's ridiculous. Well, and how many people start out with uh, drugs for pain? And yes, get hooked. Yes, yes. Obviously, our pain pills are are addictive, uh, and of course, I, I think most people would love to take something for pain that wasn't addictive. And again, cannabis is one of those possibilities, but it's not available to most people. Mm-hmm. So, what do we do, for God's sakes? I mean, this seems so. You know, as we're talking and the threads of our discussion are going in different directions, it's it reminds me of like a spider web. <laughs> you know, I mean, it. it <laughs> we're not talking about a, a small, narrowly focused topic here. This is it, it. It reaches out into all of society, and and what do we do? Well, I think. Of course, one of the first things is important to know is why all this is happening. And the reason it's happening is because we don't adhere to the libertarian non-aggression principle. And for those of your listeners who aren't familiar with it, the non-aggression principle is basically what we learned as children. <laughs> you know, mm. you don't uh, you don't use you don't initiate physical force against someone. You don't steal their stuff. You don't defraud them. And if you do, like if you throw a baseball accidentally through your neighbor's window, you replace it. You restore the victim as much as possible. And we do that on a one-to-one basis. You mm-hmm. know, if we were neighbors, that's how we'd relate to each other. But when we when we interact through government, we don't do that. We force people. We bend them to our will. And to just kind of give a quick example, so if I came to you and I said, would you contribute to my favorite charity? And you said, no, not today. I'd probably smile and say, okay, maybe maybe next time. Mm-hmm. But what we do uh, what we do through government is we force each other 
to pay taxes for our particular pet project. So if I force you to pay taxes for my pet project, you're going to turn around and force me <laughs> to pay for your pet project. And this is this kind of goes in a circle. And this is what's happening with regulations as well, because everything we've been talking about is a regulation. So in other words, we force people, uh, we force drug companies not to sell their drugs to people who desperately want them unless the FDA approves, for example. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to understand, when you talk about the spider web, this is how the spider web is created, when we are willing to initiate force against our neighbor or have government do it for us. But now getting back to the specifics of what we started to talk about, the FDA, um, because of all these court cases, as I said, we not only need to do away with the amendments and realize they were bad law and repeal them, we probably need to take the approval power away from the FDA in order we'll be able to use these court cases to basically continue what it's been doing. Mm -hmm. And to make sure that our drugs are safe. And I should mention the safety studies show that drugs are no safe, safer after the amendments than before. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, that's yeah, that's a good that point. We haven't gained anything for all this, and they're they're no more effective. So we haven't gained anything with these amendments other than higher costs and loss of life, which is a loss, not a gain. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if we if we wanted to make sure drugs were safe. If we left the FDA in place as a certifying agency, people who respected the FDA could wait for them to bless the drugs, so to speak, but mm -hmm. they could always take them if they wanted to. They, they wouldn't be forced or stopped at gunpoint if necessary from taking them. So this is, this is a way to, to make things work. And then these certifying agencies would probably spring up, and there actually are several of them already, that would evaluate the drugs themselves and report out. So we have some of those, and we actually have some consumer groups that are doing a really good job. For example, the Abigail Alliance. Hmm, I haven't heard of that. No, they were the ones that instigated this suit against, that suit against the FDA uh, with the cancer patients, mm -hmm. and that's because Frank Burroughs, the head of the organization, lost his daughter because the FDA would not let her take a cancer drug that was geared to her specific type of cancer. They wouldn't let her take it till the last minute. You know, he fought for months and months to get her get permission to let her take that. So that was a big mistake by the FDA because Frank Burroughs is on fire and he he wants to show people that this is a problem. And so what he does, he studies these cancer drugs and his organization has recommended that 40 cancer drugs be approved years before they were actually approved by the FDA. So if a consumer group can can recognize what works. Uh, years before the FDA gives approval, then you know the process is too slow. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the street, Public Citizen has uh, a Best Pills, Worst Pills newsletter, and they have pointed out uh, a number of really bad medications that should be taken off the market, and about 50% of those have actually been taken off. And of course, they also made that recommendation years before it happened. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we've got consumer groups that are educated enough to even give evaluations of these drugs. So if we have consumer groups, not really scientists that can to do that well, clearly a scientific group that was certifying drugs could do a better job. And it's important for your listeners to know the FDA doesn't do any studies. They tell the pharmaceutical companies what studies they want the pharmaceutical companies to do. Mm -hmm. And so the drug companies are doing the studies that get submitted to the FDA. It would be so much better to have a third party evaluation that actually worked with the drugs. And some of these certifying agencies do just that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Just, so there's a lot of changes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, one of the things that I, it, that kind of struck me was when you're talking about, I, I know like pharmaceutical reps go in and talk to the doctors about their, you know, their drugs and how to use them and, you know, try to push that. And it really, it's a shame that nutraceutical companies can't go in and talk to doctors about what they have available and and what what has been shown to be helpful and and then let the doctor make a choice and experiment and try different things with their patients. 
Yes, but as you mentioned, and we talked about, uh, experimentation is not is not encouraged in the medical profession anymore. It's all about standard of care. And the FDA feels like unless it is blessed what anybody is saying to the doctors, <laughs> you know, then it shouldn't be said. So mm -hmm. that's really a violation, I think, of our First Amendment, but uh, the courts have not agreed. Well, and that is why I'm so jazzed about functional medicine now because people who practice functional medicine are very much into experimenting. Um, like Dr. Matt Flory says, I, he's a forensic, <laughs> a forensic doctor. He loves to get in and really try to figure out what's going on and experiment with different, different modalities to help a person get better um, as opposed to just the cookie cutter method. Well, yes, because we're all different. You know, that's another thing. The standard of care. I mean, I don't want the standard of care. I want something that's personalized to my particular body and my particular environment, and my particular genetics. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, a lot of people just go to a doctor and they just trust whatever whatever that person says. And, you know, not everybody's interested in really digging down and learning about these things and researching it. So they just go along with whatever, you know, they figure this, this person, this man or woman has had X number of years of education and they're the expert. But, you know, most of these people don't even have any, um, any training in nutrition. No, I know when I was writing Healing Our World, I actually contacted the AMA to see how, how much nutritional background doctors had to have. And they didn't even, most of them don't, don't even get a full course of nutrition. So this is very sad. I, I don't understand it at all. I really don't. It's like, <laughs> you mean to tell me that, that there is a whole body of medical people who don't think that what you put into your body has any makes any difference in your health. It's just... Yeah, I mean it's so it's ridiculous because of course uh, you know we'll starve to death if we don't eat. So obviously food is important, and which type of food I know is important just from the animal studies that I've. I've shared with you and how we had to create disease models by taking away the nutrition because the animals were so hardy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they optimized their nutrition. They were really hard to get sick. <laughs> well, you know, I've been lately, I've been seeing a lot of articles on the internet about cancer in pets. Your dog or cat, they, they only get what you give them you know, unless they're good mousers, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you know, and I, I look at a lot of the pet food and the first ingredient is corn. I'm like, what dog eats corn? Or They're meat eaters. Yes, right. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. And the pet food that I'm talking about is what the veterinarians are selling. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, our animals are going to also get sick because they're eating stuff stuff they no, wouldn't normally eat. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I want I want a, a meat of some sort as the first ingredient. And I, I, I don't want corn and wheat and, you know, all, all of those grains and starch and, and carbs that they, they wouldn't normally eat if they were on their own. Yes, but you know, I think it must taste good because my cats, for example, they don't like the high protein uh, chow. They like the... <laughs> What we'd call the junk food of. <laughs> well, you know, for some reason, I still don't really understand why, and maybe you do, but our taste buds seem to be all wanting sugar. And even animals. I mean, my dog gets her only, only thing that she gets that's not high quality pet food or meat is a little bit of vanilla ice cream when I have vanilla ice cream. <laughs> and I've let all of my dogs have a little bit. But I'll tell you, she can smell that a mile away. And she is right there for her ice cream. Now, <laughs> Well, I can tell you, yes, evolutionarily, we have a sweet tooth. And the reason we do is because somewhere along the way, we lost our ability to manufacture vitamin C. Most other animals do that. They don't need to take it. It's not a vitamin for them. But we lost that ability as a species. And so the place we get most vitamin C in the wild, so to speak, would be fruits. So we are genetically engineered to seek out sweetness. And this is why sugar is so addictive to us, because our bodies uh, think that sweetness is associated with vitamin C, which we really need. 
Oh, this is fascinating. I had no idea. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So, oh, interesting. So to take that a step further, and I'm probably off the wall, but if you took a bunch of vitamin C, would you, would you have less of a, uh, a craving for sugar? I think some people might actually, I, I haven't, um, I haven't really looked into that at all myself, but it wouldn't surprise me. Let's put it that way. Now there's an interesting experiment people could try without harming themselves because my understanding is if you take too much vitamin C, pretty much you just, uh, don't you get diarrhea? Yes. Yeah. So kind of irritated a little bit. So you obviously don't want to take so much that that happens. Right. So anyway, interesting. Because I've yes. always been fascinated by that. Like, why are we so addicted to sugar? Why is it so hard to stay away from? I try very hard not to do any cane sugar. It, it cuts out a lot of things that you can have. <laughs> you know? sure, so, sure. Uh, so I do honey and maple syrup and things like that. But boy, when it's somebody's birthday and there's a birthday cake, I'm like, oh, shit. I just, <laughs> you know, there's something about a birthday cake. <laughs> and, and, and I go, oh, well, you know, I know I'm going to feel like crap after I eat it, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Well, of course, if if you're going to do that now, of course, if you know how to mix your food properly, and I'm now referring to the research uh, from the Zone Diet, Dr. Barry Sears, I'll just throw out some URLs here, zonediet.com and drsears.com. Okay. Uh, You know, if you're going to eat sugar, Mm -hmm. obviously the bad news about that is you're going to have this uh, spike of glucose. Mm Mm-hmm. And you're going to have this insulin rush. But the way you can attenuate that or slow it down a bit is to have some protein mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to eat sweets, a little bit of protein is a good idea. Yeah, and you know, different people are different too. According to Barry Sears, about a, a third of the population doesn't have a huge glucose spike when they eat sugar, but about two thirds do. And of course you can check your own, um, especially now they have, uh, again, your listeners might be interested in this if they try to control their blood sugar. Abbott has finally gotten their continuous glucose monitor approved here in the U S and it's not that pricey. Uh, Walgreens has it. I think the reader, which you only have to buy once is $80 and the um, sensor, which you put on your arm for for ten days, uh, costs about forty dollars. And with this with this apparatus, you get continuous glucose reading for ten, for ten days, twenty oh, four seven. And you can download it to your computer. And what I use it for is to check, you know, meals that I have regularly. Okay, so what you know what happens when I eat these meals? Are they really, uh, you know, spiking my glucose, or are they you know, are they in a good space? And mm-hmm. so that way you can, you can find out what it does to you. And that will give you some feedback too, because it's amazing. Some meals that look pretty innocuous <laughs> can be pretty bad for your blood glucose and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. Now it, what it, you put on your arm, is it like a Fitbit kind of thing or? It's, it's actually like a, a needle, um, but you know, it's not too bad. Uh, you know, if you've ever had to take finger sticks for your blood glucose, mm-hmm. It doesn't hurt as much as that, (laughs) at least not for me. So basically it's a spring loaded device. You put it on your arm. It stays in place for those 10 days. You can bathe and do whatever you normally do. I've been in the pool, you know, so yeah, so you can keep it in place and then you pull it off after 10 days and you know, if you want to replace it, of course you can. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mentioned the prices because unless you're a an insulin dependent diabetic, your insurance probably won't pay for it at this stage in the game. Mm-hmm. But I found it was well worth paying for because I got some big surprises. <laughs> Interesting. So if somebody wanted to check this out, what's it, the product called? It's Abbott's um, Freestyle Libra, L-I-B-R-E. Okay. Freestyle yeah, so, Libra. Okay. Yeah, it's continuous glucose monitoring. Again, you need a reader, which you only have to buy once, mm-hmm. and a sensor, which is the the spring loaded needle that you actually put in your arm. It's a very thin needle. It does not hurt very mm-hmm. much. Mm-hmm. And so this is something that anybody can do. You don't have to have a script for or anything like that. Uh, at Walgreens, I have not had to have a script. Now the box says you need one, so I don't know if Walgreens in my area is just doing it, mm-hmm. <laughs> giving a. Press. 
But you know, most glucose monitors don't require a prescription. So that's why Walgreens, every time I ask them, do you need a prescription? They say, no, we don't need a prescription. It's a glucose monitor Mm because, you know, they normally don't require prescriptions. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. That's, that's a good sideline. I like that. Thanks. (laughs) Sure, sure. (laughs) Yeah, I have a lot of little tidbits. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, there's one other thing that I I don't know if you want to get into this, but um, I was reading on your on your website that you are interested in ethical issues surrounding assisted suicide. Yes. uh And I think that's very important, especially when people are terminally ill. My mom passed four years ago. She was 89 and um, she was done, you know, and she decided to stop eating and drinking. And she had the support of her physician, took about, actually, he thought it was going to take a couple of weeks, but it only took a week. They had her on morphine for pain um, so that she could pass peacefully. And I remember my sister saying like three days before she passed, she was at her desk writing, doing her finances, writing her checks and <laughs> getting everything in order for us. She was pretty incredible. I think it's a, it, it's an important topic. I wanted to see if you'd like to comment on that a little bit. Sure. Well, of course, I was in Michigan at the time that Dr. Kevorkian was working in Michigan, and Mm -hmm. my sister was actually one of his patients, and I was her caregiver. So, of course, I I went to Dr. Kevorkian with her. And I have to say that it uh, obviously, when anyone and when any loved one is leaving, it's very difficult, but it was made a little bit better, I think, by having a he- healthcare professional there to work with her and abide by her wishes. And she was very adamant that that's what she wanted to do. She had to go into surgery and the doctor told her she might have cancer. And she told me even before the surgery, you know, Mary, if this is cancer, I, I'm not going to suffer. I'm going to go to Dr. Kevorkian. And that's pretty much what she did. Uh, you know, when she got bad enough that the cancer had spread all over, she made that decision. And, of course, it, it was made so much harder because the whole thing was illegal at the time in Michigan. So that was just added pressure on everyone. And yeah, you know, it, it's it's crazy because, you know, what right does anyone have to tell you what to do with your body and how much you should suffer? But again, the state, the government wants to stop us at gunpoint, if necessary, from taking our own lives. And we decide it's time. And you know, this is just inappropriate in my my estimation. And, and having gone through that experience I feel I can I can say something that most people can't say, and that is that when somebody uh, commits assisted suicide, they actually are helping other people stay alive. And the reason for this is that our medical profession is so overworked that major mistakes are made every day simply because doctors don't have enough time to look at things. Um, and I can give several examples in my family. My sister, for example, had a scan right after her first surgery. And the radiologist put the notes in her report and said, hey, this lady has a couple bumps on her ovaries. And normally, we'd probably just think they're cysts. But since she's had cancer, we need to look at this. Well, her doctor, I don't think had time to read the report or misinterpret it or something, because he told her that the scan didn't show anything. And when she got the report, then it took her a few months to get it. By that time, the the cysts on her, the supposed cysts on her ovaries had already grown and were tumors and she could feel them. So mm. this is the kind of medical mistake that's made every day, but but most people aren't aware because as you said, they don't really look into things. And so when when my sister decided to take her own life, what she did is she freed up a bunch of medical resources for the people who want to fight till the very end. And maybe, I I like to think that because she took that route, maybe a doctor who would have been overstressed, (laughs) you know, is, is going to see something that they wouldn't have otherwise seen and, and saved a patient's life. So, you know, this is another kind of hidden part of the equation that we don't normally see unless we're actually involved in it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think it's another reason to be proactive. You know, yes. don't just 
trust that everybody's on top of things because doctors are overworked. They're human beings too, and they do miss things. And sure. um, it's it's a I think it's really important to be proactive because nobody cares about your health the way you do. <laughs> That's right. And it's important for your listeners to understand that the reason doctors are overworked is because of all the regulations surrounding the licensing of medical professionals. Just like we talked about how dangerous the regulations surrounding uh, drug approvals are, it's the same thing with medical licensing. It limits what you can get. And so, so what it has done is it has limited the number of doctors that can be licensed in the U.S., uh, from U.S. medical schools. And so now what we're doing is starting to import healthcare professionals from other countries because we're so backed up. So how does licensing, I'm not clear about how is licensing affecting this then? Okay, so so it used to be the doctors made about the same amount of money as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And they could apprentice with another doctor, for example, to learn their trade. Um, or they could go to night school. But what happened is in the 19, early 1900s and leading up to the 1930s, there was a lot of uh, pressure to have each state decide that that wasn't good enough, that now uh, if you wanted to be a doctor, you had to go to a particular type of medical school for four years. And of course, this meant that you couldn't have a job while you were doing it because there was no time. So you couldn't go to night school. You couldn't apprentice anymore with a doctor. You no, know, instead you had to go through this very elaborate residency and internship. So what ended up happening is only people who could afford to be out of work for four to eight years uh, could go to school and go to the residency. You did get paid a little bit for the residency and internships, but it's pretty minor. Mm -hmm. So so only people who had the ability to borrow money or had money were able now to become doctors. And the way that the board, uh, medical boards functioned is they only allowed so many doctors to be licensed. And, oh. and this, was all, this was all very open. I mean, if you look at the Journal of the American Medical Association, it talks about having professional birth control so that salaries could go up. <laughs> and if you look at chapter five of healing our world, I, I discussed this a little bit. So, you know, you can kind of get up to speed on that. So this is, hasn't been hidden. It's, it's very much out in the open. And so consequently, our doctors now make a lot of money, but they also have one of the highest suicide rates in the country because of all the pressure they're under. Wow. That just sounds totally ridiculous. Yes, it is. Because there's many, when I was in college, you know, it seemed like you, there were like maybe one prospective medical student per five to 10 were allowed in medical school. And this was crazy. You know, there, there could have been, there was a demand and more medical schools could have been built and we could have had more doctors, but again, it was all limited by the, the licensing laws. Mm -hmm. Wow. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Oh, this has really been fascinating, Mary. I thank you so much. Is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? Yes. Well, I, again, I, I, of course, uh, I'd like to encourage people to look into death by regulation, and they can go to a number of places. Uh, we have a website, deathbyregulation.us. It's also available on Amazon. And we had a big push uh, prior to April 10th to get on the Amazon bestseller list. And hopefully when your listeners go to the Amazon site, they will uh, be able to contribute to that if they want to order the book that way, or they can order it directly through deathbyregulation.us. The thing I'd like to remind them is that for another couple of weeks, we probably will have some free gifts associated with purchasing the book. Mm -hmm. If you if you order through deathbyregulation.us, you'll get those automatically in the autoresponder because they're digital gifts. Okay. But if you go to Amazon, it's okay. Just send me an email through my website, ruart.com, R-U-W-A-R-T.com, and I will send you a link to get those bonuses. So I don't want anyone to feel like they are going to miss out if they order through Amazon. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And um, it also, ruart.com is the 
best way for people to connect with you and get more information about you? Yes. And the reason is that I get a little flag when I get an email from ruart.com. I get about a thousand emails a day. Oof. So I, I don't want to miss anybody's <laughs> email, but <laughs> sometimes, sometimes if you just email me directly to my email address, then, you know, it doesn't quite get through. So I suggest going to ruart.com. Wow. How did you get back to me so fast? <laughs> <laughs> I can't even imagine going through that many emails. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, most of it's junk, of course, and I've, I've learned how to handle it. But occasionally something gets lost. So I do respond to all my emails. If somebody uh, emails me and you don't hear back, try again, please. <laughs> no, that's that's good to know because I know, yeah, a lot of times things might end up in spam or something. And I know when I email somebody, uh, especially if I'm, exploring having them on the podcast I give it you know usually a few days and if I don't hear then I'll just you know try again and see if maybe it got lost or they just were busy and set it aside because I know sometimes I'll set an email aside uh, because I don't have time to do a long answer and then I forget about it because it keeps going you know lower and lower and you don't see it anymore so <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I do. I'm really good about answering my emails if I see them. So make right. sure I see them. <laughs> okay, great. That's good to know. Well, this has been really, really inspiring. And I learned a lot. And I hope our listeners do too. I'm sure I'm sure they learned a lot too. I did order your book. So I'm really looking forward to reading it. It's probably not on Audible yet. Not yet. No, we will have a Kindle version coming out in a couple of months and Audible. I think it'll be a couple of months after that. It takes a little longer to get the Audible version done, right. But, right. but we will have it. <laughs> the only reason I like Audible is because I knit and crochet. It's hard to read and knit and crochet at the same exactly, time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and being the great multitasker that I am. <laughs> Exactly. I understand perfectly. Yes. <laughs> oh, great. Well, thank you so much. All the information also for our listeners that uh, Dr. Root has given us about how to get a hold of her and order the book will also be um, on the podcast website. And remember that that's www.realjanine.com. And Janine, once again, is J-A-N-E-A-N. Thank you so much, Mary. Dr. Mary Root has been wonderful to share her story and her knowledge. I hope everyone has enjoyed my conversation with her. Thank you, my dear. And thank you. Thank you for having me. And I hope your listeners have a great day. Oh, thank you. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, I know I've had my eyes opened and I'm looking forward to reading uh, Dr. Mary Burrett's new book. So once again, if you missed any of the information to connect with Dr. Ruart or to order her book, go to the podcast website, realjanine.com. I also have pictures of my guests. It's always fun, I think, to be able to see who it is who's been talking. It just creates more of a connection for me anyway. There's show notes. There will be links to all my guest websites and the opportunity to listen or download episodes. You can also sign up for my email list. It only comes out twice a month, and it always includes a yummy recipe. Do you have friends who would benefit from this conversation? I'm sure you do. Everyone needs to listen to this. I think it's really important. So please share the love. It's my joy to be able to have interesting conversations with people who have information and perspectives that can enrich our lives and your help in getting the word out is greatly appreciated. Don't forget, you can also subscribe to Keeping It Real with Janine on iTunes so you don't miss an episode. If you subscribe, they'll automatically be um, in your podcast app. Also, you can subscribe through your favorite podcast provider. And if you have a moment to leave a rating or a short review, that would be awesome. Thanks again for listening. Take care and be well.